Flagler Museum as well. Uh, my name is John Blades. I'm the director of the Flagler Museum. This is our 25th year of doing the Whitehall Lecture Series. The goal of this series is to give us the context for the time period that this house represents. And uh, we focus each lecture series on a theme. This year, the lecture series is based on the theme of popular entertainment. We've heard about the role of Nickelodeons and how popular they were in last week's lecture. We've heard about vaudeville and its popularity. Uh, we've heard about, um, gee, I'm trying to think now. It seems like it's, oh, well, it's only been five weeks, right? Coney Island and amusement parks. The very first amusement park, of course, Luna Park, and Fred Thompson, and what a, an amazing uh, career he had. It's been a good lecture series. You know, they didn't have radio and television and internet back then, so what did people do with their time? That's really the question we're trying to answer with this year's lecture series. Our fifth and final lecture, and it's gratifying to see that Oscar Wilde can still turn out an audience here, right? Years, 100 years, or almost 100 years after his death. Um, an interesting guy, to say the least, and we're lucky to have with us today the editors of a book called Oscar Wilde in America. It's a collection of his interviews during his lecture tour to America in 1882. Uh, and uh, Gary Scharnhurst is, is going to uh, give a lecture here on uh, Oscar Wilde. We have the book available as well following the lecture. Now, these lectures are webcast live. That means anybody in the world can join us for this lecture and see the slides you're going to see, hear our lecturer talk, and even ask questions at the end of the lecture. Um, and we have a few who have joined us. I know we, we always have one. The guy from Michigan always joins us, right? He's there. Hello, Michigan. Thanks for joining us. I should say welcome to everybody who's joined us in cyberspace for this lecture. Uh, I want to thank the staff, of, especially the education staff of the museum, for helping to make these lectures possible. And I, of course, want to thank our sponsors. Iberia Bank is our lead sponsor for this lecture series. They're a great community-oriented bank, uh, and, and the Palm Beach Post is also a sponsor of the lecture series. I, I want to take just a second to remind you, if you have cell phones, to, to take a, just a second to turn them off so that they don't inadvertently uh, interrupt the lecture. And I also want to remind you that we have plenty of other programs going on at the museum. We are, we are we're rapidly working our way through the Palm Beach season here, but there are still other programs to come before the season is over, and you have a season program guide and a couple of postcards at your seats that uh, remind you of the other programs we have here at the Flagler Museum this season. Uh, Gary Scharnhurst is here along with his co-editor, Matthew Hoffer, who they're from the uh, University of New Mexico. They put together this book, and I should hold it up for you, Oscar Wilde in America, a collection of his interviews during his 1882 trip. Gary is going to do the lecture for us. I think you'll find that he has some fascinating insights on a fascinating person. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Gary. Thank you for being here, you guys. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blades. Um, as uh, he mentioned, uh, Matt Hofer and I are uh, editors of this volume. I'm reminded of uh, a story about uh, T.S. Eliot, who uh, early in his career uh, edited a couple of magazines. He was asked once uh, whether he believed all editors are failed writers. He said yes, but then so are most writers. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming and uh, thank uh, those of you who are turning in my webcast. When Oscar Wilde arrived in New York on January 2nd, 1882, according to legend, he was asked by a U.S. customs agent if he had anything to declare. He reported, uh, reportedly replied, only my genius. <laughs> At the age of 27, Wilde was already an international celebrity, born to privilege, if not to the manner. His father had been a successful surgeon uh, and Irish patriot, his mother a popular poet and proponent of Irish home rule. In 1878, Wilde graduated from Oxford, where he earned a double first, the highest grades possible in modern and classical literatures. At the university, he also became a disciple of John Ruskin and Walter Pater, as well as a self-described esthete, or devotee, to the religion of art and the cult of beauty. He moved to London in 1879 and published his first volume of poetry, in 1881. 
He came to America in 1882 to lecture on aestheticism, to proselytize on behalf of the religion of art. And make no mistake, he believed that, as he said, the best service to God is found in the worship of all that is beautiful. Though he was originally scheduled to spend only a few weeks in America, Wilde remained nearly a year and lectured over 150 times from coast to coast, from New York and Boston in the east to San Francisco and San Jose in the west, Atlanta and New Orleans in the south, and even Toronto and Montreal in Canada. In all, he traveled about 15,000 miles. After expenses, his share of the box office receipts totaled about $6,000, or about $80,000 in 2010. He addressed crowds that numbered in the hundreds and even thousands during the first weeks of his tour. By his own estimate, he spoke to a total of some 200,000 people, and an estimated 70% of his auditors were women. In uh, one of the contemporary illustrations of uh, Wilde at an aesthetic reception, you see uh, the long-haired Wilde surrounded by women in the foreground and their husbands, as you can see, uh, distant in the background. <laughs> or you'll uh, appreciate a cartoon of Wilde uh, courting a, a Boston matron, uh, trying to interest her in his religion of art. She looks a little dubious, but uh, at the very least, rest assured that Wilde's audiences were mostly composed of women. Perhaps his largest audience was in Chicago on January 13th, less than two weeks after he arrived, when over 3,000 people uh, heard him. Over the next couple of months, however, the crowds gradually dwindled. He compensated by cutting the length of his lectures from 90 to 40 minutes. Part of the problem was he exhausted the venues where he might attract large numbers of listeners. In April, in Atchison, Kansas, for example, he drew a crowd of only about 30 people. Another part of the problem was his choice of topics. His lectures on the decorative arts and the house beautiful hardly appealed to country folks scratching out a living on a farm. A third part of the problem was Wilde's speaking style. By most accounts, and even by his own admission, it was dreadful. Still, he was treated as a celebrity wherever he went, though not always favorably. I exaggerate but slightly when I say that Wilde's entire months-long lecture tour was a protracted performance of equal parts comedy and drama. Thanks to his London tailor, he dressed the part of an aesthete, and he helped design his wardrobe. During his first week in New York, before he had delivered a single lecture, he sat for the famous photographer Napoleon Cerrone at his Manhattan studio. Cerrone had bought the exclusive right to photograph Wilde for the, new, uh, for the North American tour, and he shot some 27 pictures of him to be sold in the lobby of each house along the route. Wilde later regretted the arrangement. There are literally no photos of him anywhere else in America during this year, except for the 27 taken in Cerrone's studio in January. At the very least, however, the marketing tie-in between the lectures and the photos, like a product placement in a modern movie, suggests how commercially successful Wilde's agent expected the tour to be. In Kansas in May, he told an interviewer that the demand for his photos far exceeded the supply. Fourteen of the photos feature Wilde in a winter coat. As his mother wrote him from England, the photographs are greatly admired here, especially the standing figure in the fur coat. They are beautifully executed. I only object to the hair parted in the center. <laughs> Mothers, I guess, are universally concerned with the length of their son's hair. As several of the photos show Wilde in a waistcoat, his standard costume, as he explained, waistcoats will show whether a man can admire poetry or not. 
Two of them show him in a velvet coat and breeches, the uniform he typically wore in hotel rooms when he was interviewed. Again, as he explained, men should dress more in velvet as it catches the light and shade. Trousers become dirty in the street, knee breeches are more comfortable and convenient. And finally, in four of the photos, Wilde is dressed, actually that's uh, another of the photos of uh, Wilde in a velvet coat. Finally, in the four of the photos, he's uh, dressed in a broad-brimmed hat, a cravat, and a cloak. The large hat of the last century was sensible and useful, he said, and nothing is more graceful in the world than a broad-brimmed hat. We have lost the art of drape, uh, draping the human form, and the cloak is the simplest and most beautiful drapery ever devised. Please note that in none of these photos is Wilde holding a lily or a sunflower, emblems of the aesthetic movement, and a point of which I'll return later. He wore these outfits uh, and others on stage during his lectures. On some occasions, he also wore a single white kid glove, reminiscent of Michael Jackson, <laughs> whose appeal a century later was similarly based on his androgynous appearance. I would even go so far as to argue that Jackson's affectation was inspired by Wilde. The commercial success of Wilde's tour can be measured by the extent to which his fame was exploited. During his months in the U.S., a number of popular songs were written about him, with such titles as the Oscar Wilde Forget-Me-Not Waltz. His image was also pre uh, pre reproduced in advertisements. Uh, you'll recall that image, which was reproduced in an advertisement for cigars. Or you'll remember this image, which was reproduced in an advertisement for men's hats. Wilde's long hair and foppish outfits, especially the knee breeches and cape, immediately sparked rumors about his sexuality. Put another way, during the lecture tour, Wilde repeatedly challenged the gender norms of middle-class America. Many of the reporters who covered the tour mentioned his womanly air, his thick locks of brown hair, his lisp, his feminine way, sapphic speech, and effeminate voice, the almost boyish fullness and effeminacy of his face, his lips full and bright colored as a girl, According to one interviewer, he appeared to be made, quote, half of man and half of woman. Invited to a so-called bohemian luncheon at the Women's Dress Association in New York soon after his arrival, Wilde was, according to a local Penny Dreadful, measured for his petticoats and given a pair of gilt-edged corsets. Henry James referred to him as a fatuous fool, a 10th rate cad. Clover Adams, the wife of Henry Adams, described him privately as a noodle. Her meaning might have been more clear if she had said limp noodle, <laughs> whose sexuality was, quote, undecided. Wilde was nothing if not controversial and unconventional. From the moment he uh, stepped ashore in New York, he was besieged by both reporters and, for want of a better word, groupies. His arrival might uh, fairly be compared to the arrival of the Beatles in New York 80 years later. Crowds wait for my carriage, he wrote. I wave a gloved hand and an ivory cane, and they cheer. He joked that he had two secretaries, one to write my autograph and answer the hundreds of letters that come begging for it, another whose hair is brown, to send locks of his own hair to the young ladies who write asking for mine. He is rapidly becoming bald. As for reporters, he complained that there were about a hundred a day. But make no mistake, Wilde eagerly embraced the culture of celebrity. He carefully cultivated his public image. The first duty in life is to assume a pose, he once said, but the second duty is no one yet has found out. 
When asked for some details about his private life, he quipped, I wish I had one. As far as the public was concerned, Wilde existed only in the persona he created and projected. He often conducted interviews as if they were performances with a standard script. The reporter would arrive to find him lounging in a chair or on a sofa. He would leap to his feet, shake the visitor's hand, and offer him a seat. He would offer some sound bites, such as, no art is better than bad art, or industry without art is barren. And the conversation would end when his valet or his agent entered the room and explained that Wilde had another appointment or needed to dress for his lecture. He spent much of his interview time defending and defining aestheticism. As he wrote a friend in late March, he had wearied of being asked by reporters which was the most beautiful color and what is the meaning of the word aesthetic. To know nothing about their great artists is one of the necessary elements of English education, he thought. Here is the most succinct definition of the term he offered in these interviews. Aestheticism is a search after the signs of the beautiful. It is the science of the beautiful through which men seek the correlation of the arts. It is, to speak more exactly, the search after the secret of life. Despite his not so subtle condescension to the reporters, Wilde also pandered to them. In San Francisco, for example, he insisted that we should never talk of a moral or immoral poem. Poems are either well written or badly written. In art, there should be no reference to a standard of good or evil. This idea that language colors and shapes our world that life imitates art and not the other way around is Wilde's legacy. His opposition to didactic art in 1882 foreshadows his assertion uh, in the preface to his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, that there is no such thing as a moral or immoral book. Books are either well-written or badly written, that is all. For the record, these words also foreshadow his testimony on the opening day of his first trial uh, in 1895, when he spoke virtually the same sentences. Wilde's missionary work on behalf of aestheticism during his year in the colonies, as he called the US and Canada, consisted largely of actual lectures, of course. Though he left England in late December 1881, without a word of a lecture written, over the months he prepared four different talks on the English Renaissance, the decorative arts, the house beautiful, and Irish poets and poetry of the 19th century. These talks evolved over time. His first lecture, the English Renaissance, was so abstract and theoretical, he rewrote it but eventually abandoned it after the first month. He delivered his lecture on Irish poets only a few times when he needed a new topic in a city where he had already spoken. His two core lectures were about home decoration, superficially perhaps a banal subject, but one he took seriously. Each of these lectures was delivered in the imperative mood and I'll briefly summarize their arguments and quote a few sentences from them. All around you lie the conditions of a great artistic movement for every great art, he admonished his listeners. His faith in the refining influence of art was nothing less than utopian. The aesthetic movement he declared with predictable hyperbole might create a common intellectual atmosphere among all nations that might, if not overshadow the world with the wings of peace, at least make men such brothers that they would never go out and slay one another as they do in Europe. Wilde believed that the rate of art might inaugurate a millennium of peace among nations. In retrospect, he may seem extremely naive but perhaps his apparent naivete is a measure of our jaundice. 
Still, he was disappointed in the American art scene. The barren architecture, the vulgar and glaring advertisements that decorate, uh, desecrate not merely your cities, but every rock and river in America, he found appalling. Most of the buildings he saw, he insisted, were mere constructions of incongruous anachronisms. More than perhaps any other country, he added, nature has been generous in furnishing material for artists in the U.S. You have marble quarries where the stone is more beautiful in color than any that Greeks ever had for their work. And yet day after day, I am confronted with the great building of some stupid man who has used the beautiful material as if it were not precious almost beyond speech. Something better than watches, he said, should be made out of the beautiful gold which is stored up in your mountain hollows and strewn along your riverbeds. While in Colorado, he reflected that all the shining silver that I saw coming from the mines would be made into ugly coins, and it made me sad. It should be made into something more permanent, such as tea services and picture frames. He also famously promoted the natural beauty of the lily and sunflower. These two lovely flowers are in England the most beautiful models of design, the most naturally adapted for decorative art, he declared. The lily and sunflower soon became symbols of the aesthetic movement in both English and American popular culture. What is more beautiful, he asked, than the gracefully flowing outlines of the lily and the symmetry of the sunflower? With the lily, there is purity of color, and the, the sunflower always looks to the sun, never drooping its head toward the cold shadows. In his lecture on the decoration of houses, Wilde excoriated Americans for their lack of taste. I did not imagine until I went into some of your cities, he said, that there was so much bad work done. I found where I went bad wallpapers horribly designed and colored carpets and horsehair sofas. I found meaningless chandeliers and machine-made furniture, generally of rosewood, which creaked dismally. He objected to whitewashed walls, to the lack of color in a home, and to the practice of middle-class women who painted their dinner plates. I do not see the wisdom of decorating dinner plates with sunsets and soup uh, plates with moonlit scenes. We do not want a soup plate whose bottom seems to vanish in the distance. Wilde reserved special scorn for the iron stove the proud invention of Franklin. If we must have it in our homes, let us have it plain and unornamented, he insisted. Instead, it was invariably decorated with a garland of roses, black, grimy, horrid, machine-made, cast iron roses. And then on top, they put a something that so much resembles a funeral urn that we think we are living in a cemetery. Thomas Nast, in uh, Harper's Weekly, satirized Wilde's comment about cast iron stoves. The red hot stove can stand it if you can. Over the months, Wilde also went to some lengths to praise American artists and writers. He considered Edgar Allan Poe America's greatest poet, and Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, the greatest work of fiction ever written in English. He declared Ralph Waldo Emerson, who died in April of the year he was in the U.S., one of the most brilliant men of the 19th century. His friend James Whistler, he thought, was by far the greatest living painter. Most famously, while in Philadelphia, Wilde crossed the Delaware River to call on Walt Whitman, at his home in Camden, New Jersey. He later told a reporter it was the most charming day he spent in America. Whitman was the greatest man I've ever seen, he said. The simplest, most natural, and strongest character I have ever met in my life. Wilde reminisced again about his visit to Whitman while in Cincinnati a month later. The room that had most impressed me in America, he said, was the one where I met Whitman 
whom I admire immensely. There was a big chair for him and a little stool for me, a pine table on which was a copy of Shakespeare, a translation of Dante, and a pitcher of water. This room contains all the conditions for art, sunlight, good air, pure water, and the poet's works. Wiles' comments about the furnishings in Whitman's room, of course, echo his advocacy of the aesthetic movement and his lecture, The Decoration of Houses. All along his route, Wilde made headlines, often, uh, often with a witty bon mot. Upon his arrival in uh, New York, for example, he declared to the assembled reporters that he had been disappointed in the Atlantic Ocean. A local newspaper soon printed a letter to the editor in reply asserting, I am disappointed in Mr. Wilde, signed the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> When he spoke in Buffalo on February 8th, he visited Niagara Falls and again expressed his disappointment. He added, in fact, the falls must be every newlywed bride's second disappointment. <laughs> in Chicago, he blasted the iconic water tower, a landmark that had escaped the fire that destroyed so much of the city in 1871 and which is still standing today. He called it a castellated monstrosity with pepper shakers stuck all over it. In Cincinnati in February, Wilde disturbed the town fathers by expressing his wonder that criminals do not plead the ugliness of your city as an excuse for their crimes. <laughs> The Mormon tabernacle, he reported from Salt Lake City in April, has the shape of a soup kettle, and the decorations are suitable to a jail. It was the most purely dreadful building I've ever seen. Wilde elsewhere joked about the art patron who sued the railroad because the plaster cast of the Venus de Milo he ordered from Paris had arrived without its arms. <laughs> and he won the case. <laughs> but Wilde reserved his most strident criticism for the town of Griggsville in Illinois, which he visited in March. Griggsville epitomized for Wilde the small-minded rural village. When he was invited to lecture there, he responded, begin by changing the name of your town. He joked about the possibility that an art movement might begin at Griggsville. It would not last long. At present, the style is Griggsville Rococo, uh, and there are traces of archaic Griggsville. But in a few days, the Griggsville Renaissance will blossom. It will bloom for a week and then become debased Griggsville and the Griggsville decadence. On the other hand, Wilde was charmed by his experiences in the West. It was west of Chicago that I found America, he wrote. The city he most enjoyed was San Francisco. It had the most lovely surroundings of any city except Naples. More specifically, uh, he enjoyed Chinatown, the most artistic place I have ever come across, he said. He admired the teacups as delicate in texture as the petal of flowers. He was presented with a bill at a cafe made out of rice paper, the account being done in Indian ink. He reserved his highest praise, however, for the mining camp of Leadville, Colorado. At the time, Leadville was the second largest city in the state after Denver. It had a population of about 40,000. Wilde called it the richest and roughest city in the world where every man carries a revolver. I was told that if I went there, they would be sure to shoot me or my manager. I wrote and told them that nothing they could do to my manager would intimidate me. <laughs> he began to lecture uh, on the early Florentines and they slept as though no crime had ever stained the ravines of their mountain home. 
After the lecture, the miners took him to a saloon where he later wrote, I saw the only rational method of art criticism I have ever come across. Over the piano was printed a notice. Please do not shoot the pianist. He is doing his best. <laughs> the mortality among pianists there, wild added, is marvelous. The miners invited him to dine in the bowels of the richest silver mine in the world. After descending in a bucket, he said, I had supper. The first course was whiskey, the second whiskey, and the third whiskey. Despite the irony in his account of his visit to Leadville, Wilde was sincere in one respect. He believed the red shirt miners were the only well-dressed men he saw in America. Their outfits were functional. They wore wide-brimmed hats and cloaks. They also wore sensible shoes. Or as Wilde concluded, they wore only what was comfortable and therefore beautiful. Of course, Wilde's praise for the miners also earned him the disdain of satirists. Uh, you see there a lily coming out of a cowboy boot, a sunflower coming out of a cowboy boot, Wilde is holding up mining attire. In fact, Wilde's eccentricities and his advocacy of the religion of art were widely ridiculed even before he came to the US. The British humor magazine Punch burlesque aestheticism in general, and Wilde in particular, as in this cartoon. In their operetta Patience, first performed in London in uh, 1881, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan also satirized the aesthetic movement, caricaturing Wilde, among others, in the male lead, the poet Reginald Bunthorne. Wearing pantaloons, sporting a pink bow at his neck, and carrying a lily bunthorn in the first act, privately admits he really doesn't like poetry. And he sings a piece entitled, I'm an Aesthetic Sham. Um, I had thought about playing you an excerpt from that uh, song. Uh, instead, I'm going to sing it. No. <laughs> I will recite a stanza. If you're anxious for to shine in the high aesthetic line as a man of culture rare, you must get up all the germs of the transcendental terms and plant them everywhere. You must live upon the daisies and discourse in novel phrases of your complicated state of mind. The meaning doesn't matter if it's only idle chatter of a transcendental kind. And everyone will say, as you walk your mystic way, if this young man expresses himself in terms too deep for me, why, what a singularly deep young man this deep young man must be. <laughs> Applause is a no, no. <laughs> <laughs> On Wilde's part, he didn't acknowledge the parody. After he attended a performance of Patience in London, he failed to see the point, he said, though he thought it was a very pretty opera with some charming music. Produced by Diorly Cart, the same agent who arranged for Wilde's lecture tour, Patience opened in New York only three months before Wilde arrived in New York himself. A touring company performed Patience sometimes preceding and sometimes following Wilde on the hustings. That is, Oily Cart, as he was sometimes called, worked both sides of the controversy. He produced the operetta that parodied aestheticism and sponsored the lecture tour of the aesthete who more than anyone else personified it. Once he became a, a, a celebrity, Wilde's gender-bending performances were also scorned. The term aesthete was uh, corrupted in popular pronunciation sometimes to aesthete. Here's a, uh, an ad for a coat. He was mocked in satirical cartoons, as in the New York humor magazine, Puck. You won't see all of this, but uh, among the images uh, around uh, Wilde 
are the uh, inscriptions aesthetic pants cheap an aesthetic bald head our aesthetic tramp uh, an aesthetic umbrella and our aesthetic waiter the san francisco magazine wasp also satirized Hart and his minions he was caricatured on the cover of a satirical biography sold on passenger trains. On the, part of the cover of Harper's Weekly, he was depicted as a monkey admiring a sunflower. And on the front page of the Washington Post, as a degenerate offspring from the wild man of Borneo, the inscription, how far is it from this to this? the wild man of Borneo holding a coconut, wild holding a sunflower. The caption reads in part, if Mr. Darwin is right in his theory, has not the climax of evolution been reached and are we not tending downhill toward the aboriginal starting point? Occasionally, Wilde was derided from the audience. In Boston, he was mimicked by 60 Harvard students who paraded down the center aisle to the front row of the music hall, dressed in swallow tail coats, knee breeches, green ties, and silk stockings, wearing lilies in their buttonholes and carrying sunflowers. But Wilde had received advance warning and came on stage in a business suit of the normal cut, turning the trick back on the students. In Rochester, a week later, he was repeatedly interrupted by hissing students from the local university. In the middle of the lecture, an elderly black man in formal dress danced down the center aisle, holding a bouquet of flowers, exciting the crowd to laughter. In Houston, Wilde's lecture was punctuated by a ringing gong in the saloon a floor below the stage. And of course, Wilde's mission to spread the gospel of aestheticism was much debated in newspapers and magazines. Many editors speculated that he was motivated more by money than by a sincere belief in the efficacy of art. George William Curtis, an old transcendentalist and one of the editors of Harper's Monthly, allowed that public criticism of Wilde was not undeserved. The columnist Charles Webb compared Wilde to a great homely girl, one of those girls whose brother is sure to be great looking and who would be good looking herself had she been born a boy. <laughs> but the most vicious attack on Wilde was leveled by Thomas Wentworth Higginson, an old liberal war horse best known today for his failure to encourage Emily Dickinson to publish her poetry. In a piece entitled Unmanly Manhood, Higginson vilified Wilde. He had become, according to Higginson, something like a buffoon for notoriety and money. Wilde was again often charged with mercenary motives. Wilde's verse was not only mediocre but prurient. Instead of going to Ireland where he might have worked to correct the wrongs there, Wilde had, according to Higginson, come to America to pose in ladies' boudoirs, eclipse masculine ideals, and influence men by his example to become effeminate dandies. Wilde was not amused. He asked, who is this scribbling expletive deleted who, craw uh, who scrawls and screams so glibly about what he cannot understand. On the eve of Wilde's departure from New York for England, a departure that went virtually unnoticed in the American press, the London Daily News editorialized that the Americans had laughed at him, and when they tired of laughing, prop uh, promptly forgot him. He was quoted, though perhaps not accurately, that he considered his mission to America a failure. Certainly, he had not changed the culture as he had hoped. Still, Wilde's year in the colonies should on balance be regarded as at least a modest critical and commercial success. 
His most recent biographer calls the lecture tour an achievement of courage and grace, despite its logistical and other problems. However effeminate Wilde's doctrines were thought to be, the biographer concludes, they constituted the most determined and sustained attack upon materialistic vulgarity to that date in American history. Thank you. I uh, believe we have uh, time for a few uh, questions, and I'd like to invite uh, my co-editor, Matt Hofer, to join me for those. He uh, can handle the questions, I suspect, far more uh, intelligently than I. Anyone? You didn't touch on uh, Oscar Wilde's encounter with Lord Devonshire and his son. Do you care to talk about that? I know, um, uh, the question is uh, uh, whether I uh, have stayed in touch or we have stayed in touch with the Wilde's relationship with uh, Lord Devonshire and his son. And the simple answer is no. <laughs> um, I'm aware of it. I think there was a book that uh, Devonshire published about Wilde, but I must confess I've never read it. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, the question was whether Wilde willingly participated in the advertisements in which he was depicted from the Cerrone photographs, mm. and I suppose whether he was remunerated for that work. Uh, certainly there was some kind of formal agreement. Um, the contract, if one existed, has never surfaced, but um, because Wilde complained about the circumstances that he had not been able to uh, publicize the lecture tours other than with the Cerrone photographs. It would seem that uh, there was some formal arrangement. I also no doubt, uh, don't doubt, that Wilde uh, profited from the sale of those photos. They were widely distributed. And because he was accompanied on his tour by uh, an agent from the Oilies Carts uh, uh, agency, I'm assuming that that agent was responsible for the sale of the photos. If that answers the question. No, I think it's just that I was wondering if he did it improve having a... Uh, How serious uh, was it? Having a uh, prescribed advertising in the uh, Yeah, I don't, think it was, I don't think it was a goof at all. Um, Wilde took the opportunity in those photos to uh, make a statement about the functionality of wardrobe. Oh, oh, no. Yeah, he had nothing to do with uh, his appearance in the ads, and in fact, one of those two ads I showed you was the subject of a lawsuit that oh, Cerrone okay. brought against the advertiser. Yeah, that was really my question. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I'm sorry that I couldn't have answered it <laughs> easily. <laughs> Here. Yeah. Uh, one can't imagine a, a lecture series on aesthetics drawing nearly so much uh, interest now in the United States as it did then. Are we to infer from this that the United States is even less concerned with aesthetics now than it was then? Well, probably, but I'm delighted to see so many people here. Um, the appeal of Wilde's lectures, I think, was less the subject of the lectures than the appearance of Wilde himself. So, right. A question back here, I think, somewhere. Oh yeah, that's a very good question too. There was apparently a second meeting uh, between Whitman and Wilde uh, in the summer of 1882, some months after the first meeting. It's known uh, very obliquely. 
Wilde attended a dinner in Philadelphia the night of this second meeting, and one of the other dinner attendees mentioned that Wilde had said he had just come from Whitman's house. That's all that's known. Unfortunately, at least one of Wilde's biographers has speculated that they had a, a homosexual encounter on that occasion, which I think is simply stupid. Describe it as a kiss. Yeah. Um, one of Wilde's friends, 20 years later, after Wilde's death, remembered Wilde saying, the kiss of Walt Whitman is still upon my lips. But I think uh, that uh, quotation uh, ought to be uh, challenged, ought to be doubted, not only because it wasn't attributed to uh, Wilde until 20 years later, after Wilde no longer could affirm or deny it, um, but, but because uh, Wilde, at this point in his life and career, probably had not yet had a, a, a same-sex experience. What, what, what year did the Oscar Wilde die? Uh, 1900. Uh, went to jail in 1895. Uh, was in jail at hard labor, I think, for three years, and then lived the final two years of his life uh, in Paris under an assumed name, Sebastian Melmoth. <laughs> <laughs> nice choice. Oscar Wilde's well done. <laughs> I have some questions from our online. Uh, yes. First is, um, was there a certain faction of American uh, America that responded positively to Wilde's uh, visits? Yeah, the question is whether there were Americans who responded positive, uh, positively to Wilde. And uh, the answer, I think, is yes. Um, Julia Ward Howe, for example, uh, the author of uh, The Battle Hymn of the Republic, defended Wilde against the accusations of Higginson. Uh, the uh, Bohemian Luncheon, that Wilde attended in New York uh, at the Women's Dress Association was hosted by Kate Field, uh, the uh, subject of an earlier biography I've written. Uh, Field greatly admired Wilde, and indeed, the 20 or so people she invited to that luncheon, uh, most of them artists uh, or writers, uh, seemed to respond quite favorably to him. So there, yeah, there was a, uh, a critical mass, if you will, of uh, folks who at least claim to appreciate Wilde. And was there, did he do something similar in his own country, and how was the response to him there? Oh, that's interesting. He didn't, so far as I know, lecture on aestheticism back in England, but he did lecture on America, and uh, of course it was a comic <laughs> lecture. <Yeah>. He, <laughs> he derided uh, America, or American taste. If he uh, published his poetry in uh, 1881, uh, was, it, was it so fantastic that a year later <laughs> that they would have him go all over the United States for one book of poetry? You want to handle that, man? I can, I can handle that. The book of poetry was actually pretty incidental to the trip. Doily Cart brought him so that he could, in, in a backhand way, promote patience, the, the, the opera, or Blair go again and go over and sell an opera. But he came with Vera or the Nihilist, his first play, actually in his, in his hand. And he was hoping to find someone here in New York, probably, to put that play on. So though Wilde was known as a poet at the time, and certainly identified himself in that way, he wasn't brought to America as a poet at all. And he had some readers, but not many. Oh, right, yeah. Well, Wilde, as a self-promoter, actually had so much trouble selling the first edition of his poems, which was, in some sense, almost a vanity publication, that he withdrew all the copies, took them out of circulation, and then later was able to reintroduce them as the so-called second edition, so that he could show that there had been so much interest in his work, that he could, that he could unload the leftover copies, those that he couldn't sell. So that's the way that Wilde did his work, but he wasn't, in fact, very well known as a poet. He was known in, in Punch and in other satirical magazines first in England and then in America, as a representative of aestheticism, more for his appearance than for his literary endeavor. 
What, what happened to his children? Is that the question? Yeah, uh, once more a very good question. After uh, Wiles' conviction, um, his wife took uh, the two sons, uh, changed her and their names. Uh, she died shortly thereafter. In fact, uh, Wilde lived on a very small bequest uh, that she had left him uh, during his final years in Paris. And the two sons, uh, each of them surnamed Holland, went on to live reasonably normal lives. And indeed, uh, the son of one of the sons, that is Oscar Wilde's uh, grandson, Merlin Holland, uh, is still alive and a uh, Oscar Wilde specialist. It's a question all the way to the back. doubt that they're his. The, uh, the same with which I began the lecture. Uh, Mr. Wilde, do you have anything to declare? Only my genius. Um, there's no known original source for that. That may have been attributed to him. I'm not, again, an expert on the rest of Wilde's life, but I think he was in a coma the last few days, and so I uh, would doubt frankly, that any of those sayings attributed to him, uh, he actually said, unless he said them before he obviously was so sick, he was comatose. Nor do I know what those sayings are. Mm -hmm. yeah. I only know one of them. Yeah. Well, uh, he apparently was in a coma, and as he must have come to a little bit, he heard the doctors arguing over whether he could pay the bill, and he is quoted as saying, I live, I am dying as I have lived beyond my means. <laughs> Very nice. I'm dying as I have lived beyond my oh, means. And one of the others was that he looked at the wallpaper and apparently said that wallpaper is truly atrocious. Yeah. One of us is going to have to go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember that. I remember that. Well, would they be true? <coughs> tragedy of Wilde's life uh, is that while having an affair with uh, Lord Douglas, Doug or Bosey as he was nicknamed, Douglas's father, the Marquis of Queensbury, publicly accused Wilde of being a sodomite. Wilde responded by suing the Marquis for slander. And uh, the Marquis's lawyers were able to prove in a first trial uh, that it was not slander. That is to say, Wilde precipitated uh, his own outing, if that makes any sense. There were three trials in all. I think the first two trials uh, ended with hung juries or no decisions. The third trial ended with uh, Wilde's conviction. He was, that is, demonstrably proven to be a criminal according to the British Criminal Code at the time. The British police apparently delayed arresting him for some six to eight hours, hoping that Wilde would leave for Paris or for France. He did not think that uh, he would be arrested. He was, and uh, then sent to, uh, to prison for three years at hard labor, which uh, eventually caused his death, some of the injuries he suffered uh, in prison. He died at the age of uh, 
40, as I, as I recall. It's actually a, a, an incredibly tragic story and the subject of much scholarship and even uh, uh, drama. Thanks, I think we'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is terrific. We appreciate that very much. All right, uh, that one, that concludes our Whitehall lecture series for this year. I did want to address one comment that was made during the question and answer period. Uh, I think uh, Americans, the, the reason Whitehall is what it is, and some of their homes in this period look the way they look, is not because, as was the criticism coming westward from Europe, uh, not because we were imitating Western Europe uh, in our aesthetic but because Americans are trying to lay claim to thousands of years of Western cultural evolution, evolution being the key word here because Darwinian ideas as interpreted in the late 19th century were applied to all areas of life, um, and the Beaux-Arts style of architecture which drew on so many different um, backgrounds was perfect for Americans. So this place and many others like it were, were an effort to do what um, Augustus Caesar was trying to do when he turned Rome from a bricks and mortar civilization, criticized as being technically adept, sort of talented teenagers, but not, not having any aesthetic of his own. American businessmen were addressing that same criticism coming from Europe uh, when they built homes like Whitehall. So that's an issue that's obviously ongoing uh, and uh, an interesting one to discuss, but I thought I'd throw that in for your consideration. Thank you again to uh, Gary and to Matthew for being here. They're at the back of the room now. Copies of uh, Oscar Wilde in America are available for, them, for you to, to purchase and for them to sign. Thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you next year for our lecture series, which will be about the architects who shape the look of Palm Beach. <laughs>